Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. Matthew chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. And we're continuing our series this morning on the Lord's Prayer. And today's message is called, Give Us and Forgive Us. So continuing our series, today's message, Give Us and Forgive Us. Here's our scripture for this morning. Matthew chapter 6, verse 11 says, Give us the bread we need for today. Forgive us for the ways we have wronged you, just as we also forgive those who have wronged us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, I'm so grateful for this chance to be able to come and to bring this message here today. I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would join together to be pleasing in your sight. Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. I have been waiting for this part of the prayer since we started the series, even back to when we were doing the series of Tales from the Mountainside. I was waiting for today because it's about give us and it's about, uh, it's about our daily bread. And I love bread. Anybody else like bread? Just as many, If you didn't get bread, fresh baked bread, any kind of bread, some sugar, some carbs, we love it. Give us our daily bread. The concept of people giving to me sometimes, like I, 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 I like that. I like the give me part. I, I, like the, I like the forgive me part. But if I'm really, really honest, I struggle sometimes to be generous myself. And, and it's, not even some, it's not really even a conscious decision that, that causes me to struggle. It, it actually reminds me of this time that I was driving through at Starbucks on one of the ways to my eight-hour meetings. I used to have three eight-hour meetings a month. I now only have one of those, and so I kind of got rid of my eight-hour day meetings. But I was on my way, and I, I pulled into a Starbucks, and the barista, when I pulled up to the window, he was so happy to see me. He was so glad that I was there, big smile on his face. I thought it was about me. I later realized it wasn't, had nothing to do with me really at all, I think. And, uh, and so he's smiling, he hands me my drink, and he says, it's already been paid for. And I was like, oh, wow. You know, and, and as I look up, I, I see the van driving away in front of me, kind of a thumbs up sign and a, and a hand wave. And I was like, that's amazing. I just had my drink paid for. That's great. And the barista is still smiling. I take my drink and I say, well, thank you. You have a good day. And I notice like his face it just falls. And I drive away and it's not until I get on the highway that I realize, or at least I project, that the reason that he was sad was that he wanted me to pay for the person behind me. And then later I watched these YouTube videos that it was like, I don't remember how many hours where there were people driving through Starbucks drive throughs where the people just kept the random acts of kindness going and one person paid for another person who paid for another person who paid for another person. You know the part that, that I struggle with the most uh, from that story is that it never even occurred to me in that moment that I would do that. And it's something that I've done before but it never even occurred to me. And sometimes it's like the more that I have, the harder it can be to even think about being generous. Likewise, when people forgive me, when I've wronged them, I can be slow to forgive. Anybody else like to be, who likes to be forgiven? When you've done something wrong, you messed up, you like to be forgiven, that's almost everybody. But sometimes I can be slow to forgive, and it's not, really the, it's not really the small stuff. I don't really feel like a whole lot gets me, you know, like stops me or prevents me from kind of moving on with my day. And if I even like acknowledge it or remember it, just kind of keep on going. But it's like that big stuff that really can get in my way. And, and it was, I was in a uh, Bible study about forgiveness that I wasn't leading, and it wasn't that long ago when I realized how bad that I can be if somebody, if I feel like has physically hurt me, or maybe emotionally hurt me in some bad kind of way, that I could withhold forgiveness. The example that comes to my mind that I, I can share with you is uh, that when I was in kindergarten, I was tripped by a fifth grader. When I was in eighth grade, I got him back. And so like, and I was in, there I was in that uh, Bible study on forgiveness, and I was actually thinking as they were talking about forgiving people, I was thinking to myself in that moment, I wasn't being very humble, I, I was thinking to myself, I am really forgiving. I am so forgiving. And I was like, wait, there's this one time. Okay, wait, there's a second time. All right, there's three. And so there was like, kind of like three times in my life that I really had to reckon with in that Bible study to say, sometimes I'm slow to forgive. In the prayer that we are praying, the Lord's Prayer, or the disciples' prayer, we pray for our daily bread. This word daily appears only one time, and it's right here in Scripture, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. 
It's the only time that we read that. And it's been understood to mean various different things. It's translated in different English ways as daily, as necessary bread, or tomorrow's bread. And so here we pray normally our prayer is our daily bread. And so when we pray our daily bread, we're actually joining with kind of the, a host of heaven in a sense and just uh, over centuries of people because this is one of the most commonly prayed prayers from Jesus' day kind of backward and maybe even forward a little bit. And then I think even today in our churches, we pray this prayer a lot. So it's one of those commonly prayed prayers. We pray for our daily bread. And as we pray for our daily bread, we're asking God to provide what we need and we're provide, asking God to provide all that we need for today. And that's kind of key to this prayer. It's pray, asking God to provide all that we need for today. A theme Jesus, he's going to talk about this a little bit more when we get into next week's sermon in verses 19 through 34. We're going to flesh this out some more. But perhaps this lesson of praying for God to provide all we need for today, Jesus maybe learned that in Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 and 9. It says, don't give me either poverty or wealth. Give me just the food I need. Or I'll be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or I'll be poor and still and dishonor my God's name. You hear that in this, there's this two different things that are happening in that Proverbs text. There's the becoming so rich that we're so full that it might could even lead us to deny God and say, who is the Lord? Who is the one who helps me? Or the other side of that could be that we're so poor and we still, and in that way, we dishonor God's name. Which one of those, as you're sitting there this morning, do you think reflects closely, more closely your heart? Which of those reflects more closely your heart? Are you so full that you tend to kind of forget about God, that you deny God's presence at times in your life? Or maybe it's just you're so, so poor, maybe so weak, that you're dishonoring God in some way. And this might not mean just financial richness or financial poorness. It could be spiritual wealth or spiritual poverty. When we pray this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, the disciples' prayer, we're also called to remember that God provided for the people of Israel for 40 years as they wandered in the wilderness. And you see this throughout Scripture. There's always this call to remember God. It's always to remember what God has done for us in the past. And when God is talking about remembering him, he's not saying you had to live. Sometimes when I talk to people in the church about remembering something, they say like, oh, I never experienced it, so I can't remember it. Well, that's not exactly what the word means when it's used in scripture. It's not talking about something you actually lived through. It's saying you need to be reminded of. You need to reflect back on. You need to know all the ways that I was with you, all the ways that I was with your grandparents, your great-grandparents, and even generations that you haven't ever even thought of or can't even count back to. You need to remember how I, God, when God was faithful to all of your ancestors, all the people that came before you, how God has always met his people and met their needs. We read about one of the ways that God is called, we're called to remember God in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness in these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but after every, out of every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And so we're reminded that God can be trusted. We're also reminded and remember that all good things come from God. I remember when I was going through uh, my first religious schooling, I had a roommate, and I only had a roommate for one semester. I could not have a roommate uh, longer than a semester. It just didn't stick right with me. And, and I had him, and he said, William, if I study for this test you know, like for as much as humanly possible to study. And I, I go in there and I take it and I make an A. Why should I give thanks to God for that? My answer was really simple and it's one that uh, I've tried to practice and keep in remembrance throughout all of my life is because all good things come from God. Even our ability to work, even our ability to study, even our ability to earn food comes from the hand of God. And that's what he wants the people of Israel, that's what he wants his people, the church, he wants us to know. 
And it kind of makes it a little harder to say this is mine and, and, or, you know, that we have possession of stuff. And we say everything that we have is already God's, even our ability to obtain the stuff. But this lesson can be easily forgotten, which Proverbs reminds us and Jesus begins to remind us. The more that our wealth multiplies and the more that self-sufficiency and individualism is portrayed as a virtue. How many grew up kind of with the concept, and maybe you still believe it today, and I actually, I think I do in practice, uh, believe that kind of doing everything on your own and on your own power is kind of one of the higher virtues. Anybody can... Yeah, like, I, pull yourself up, take care of yourself, even your religion. I can't tell you how many times I had said in my past and have heard throughout my life of people saying, what I do is between me and God only. I came kicking and screaming to the concept of being a Christian in the context of a community. And like I've already told you, I, I've changed my way of thinking about it. I've changed my way of talking about it. But I'm not sure that I have always get it right when it comes to how I practice that. Because I, being a Christian is not a life lived in, in, on your own. It's not about what you can obtain all by yourself. And in the same way, in everything that you do in your life, it's not all about your individualism as being your strength. In fact, we are better when we're together. We're better when we are working with other people, when we're a team, and when we ask for help. And I think that might be the part we probably struggle with the most is asking for help because we just want to be able to do it all on our own. And the more that our society kind of pushes up sufficiency of individualism, the harder it is to sometimes remember that we didn't get there alone. We got there with the help of God. Amen. Moses, he warns the people as Deuteronomy 8 continues. He, he says, if you ever forget the Lord your God, and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed like the nations that the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. You can work all you want. You can work all day long. You can work as hard as you want, as much as you want, but don't ever forget where that food came from. Don't ever forget that God is the one who sustains you. God is the one who gives to you and provides for you. Never forget that. Amen. I think this concept of forgetting this in Scripture, it also kind of goes along with uh, replacing God. And if you trace that replacing God, the concept of replacing, putting yourself in the place of God, you trace that all the way back to Adam and Eve, and that's the sin that they committed. The sin that they committed was one that, that said that they would be, they would take God's place. The, the serpent said to them, surely God will not punish you if you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Maybe he just doesn't want you to know what he knows, to see things the way he sees things. And, and they kind of buy into that concept a little bit, don't they? They buy into that concept. And, and it's when they put themselves in the place of God that they sin and they fall and they are spiritually Lost. They don't physically die that day, but they spiritually die that day. As followers of Christ, we forgive because we are forgiven. As the prayer continues, we, we pray to God for forgiveness, and we remember that as a forgiven people, we forgive people. As a forgiven people, we forgive people. It really is, for, for followers of Jesus, it's that basic and that simple, at least, to say, I know it can be harder in practice. It really depends on what the person has done to you and how they've hurt you. But if you can just remember that as a forgiven person, as a forgiven and redeemed person, loved by your Holy Father who is in heaven, you have to forgive people. You have to do it. You may be, be working on it, but you have to be doing it. Like You have to be working on it. You have to forgive because forgiven people forgive people. When we pray for our own forgiveness, how many of you need forgiveness? A lot of you said you'd like to be forgiven. How many of you need that forgiveness? I'm not even going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads and then count the hands. and you know I'm not even going to do that. But I know deep down that every single one of us, we need to be forgiven. I need to be forgiven. And as we pray this prayer and we ask for our own forgiveness, we simultaneously pray for the forgiveness of others. 
as we forgive those who have wronged us. Have you ever noticed that link before? I bet you have. You've noticed that link between God's forgiveness for ourselves and our ability to forgive others? Have you seen that link? And if you go down just a couple more verses to verses 14 and 15 in Matthew chapter 6, it says, If you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your sins. Wow. I like to be forgiven. But if I struggle to forgive other people, and if I'm sitting around the table at Thanksgiving and Christmas and there's people that are sitting there that I've not been able to forgive yet, that I've not been willing to let go. And forgive doesn't mean, I think in, in the sense of God and forgiveness, forgiving means from God's perspective, like forgetting. It even says in Scripture that when God forgives our sins, he scatters them as far as the east is from the west and, and it's like he forgot. It doesn't mean that he actually forgot, but he forgot it in terms of he's not holding it against us. For us in the human side, I think this might be the one place where I really try to give us a break and say sometimes forgiveness for us, it doesn't mean forgetting. You know, forgiveness for us doesn't mean if every time I walk through the door, you know, like Dennis like caps me in the knee, like I'm not going to keep walking through that same door over and over and over again and let him continue to hurt me over and over and over again. So forgiveness from the human perspective doesn't mean, it doesn't mean forgetting altogether and acting like nothing has happened. But forgiveness from the human perspective does mean that we extend forgiveness, that we have forgiven, that we've let go of. And that hard word from God, this whole section, the Sermon on the Mount that we started just several weeks ago, over and over again has said stuff that has challenged me. I don't know if it's challenged you, but I hope that it has. If you forgive other people their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, neither will your heavenly Father forgive forgive your sins. As a forgiven people, we have to forgive people. And think about it this way. When we forgive other people, we're releasing them of the debt that is owed to us. We're releasing those people. And, and actually, Jesus is playing again off of something in the Old Testament. It's called the years of Jubilee. In the Old Testament, it talks about forgiving people their debts. And some of the English versions translate the, the, the Lord's Prayer. It translates debts. We usually say transgressions. There was one week that I preached at a Presbyterian church, and as I was leaving, the, the main person, the main greeter, I guess, hanging out by the door, all he said to me was debts. And I went home that entire day. I remember I sat on my couch, and sometimes, uh, the more I've preached, I don't do this quite as much, but still sometimes. And I sat there all day long thinking, what was this person talking about debts? What did I say about debts? And the thing was, I didn't say anything about debts, but I didn't know when the Presbyterian Church prays the Lord's Prayer, they say, forgive us of our debts as we forgive those who have, I guess, debts against us. And we say trespasses, typically in our prayer. But the I concept of debts here is talking about the years of Jubilee. The, the practice of, of, of Old Testament Israel was to forgive people every seven years all their debts. And then it also says, it says seven times seven, which is 49. And so every seventh year or 49 years, and some people think that they practice it on the 50th year, kind of round it up. And some people even say that they didn't really practice it at all. But the concept was supposed to be that every seven years, every 50 years, they would forgive people all their debts. And so when we pray for people's debts to be forgiven, it's talking about literal financial debts. And it also is talking about forgiving them of the way that they've sinned against us. Oscar Wilde said, always forgive your enemies. Nothing annoys them so much. So maybe forgiveness, that could be the level of forgiveness you start at. Is you just know that you're, by forgiving them, you're releasing them, and maybe it's bothering them more than it bothers you. Of course, that doesn't really sound like the heart of God to me. But what does sound like the heart of God to me comes from a, a quote from Paul Bowes. that says, forgiveness doesn't change what happened in the past, but it can change what happens in the future. Forgiveness doesn't change what happened in the past, but it can change what happens in the future. When you forgive other people, you're releasing that debt that you were holding over their head and you're freeing them, but you're also freeing yourself. You're freeing yourself because now like, it's not something that you're having to walk around with. 
It's not baggage that you're having to carry on your shoulders. It's not uh, baggage that, you know, like causes you to have uh, ulcers. It's not baggage that causes you to kind of have heart palpitations and to, to mentally stress about it and anguish about it because you've forgiven and you've let it go. You've let it go and you've given it to God. And it may not change what happened in the past, but it gives you a place that you can begin to move forward in the future. So when you pray, pray like this and join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the power.